Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. And away we go. Here we are with episode number 44 of the Principles of Performance podcast. I am your host, Eric Degatti. Wow, rough start. Don't even know your own name. I'm Eric Degatti. And this is uh, my co-host and friend, Mike Perry. Mike, hopefully you're, you're doing better than I am with my name. Hi, I'm Ron Burgundy. and It's good to be here. <laughs> I'm Ron Burgundy. Um, anyways, fantastic intro. Um, you know, we're doing well here. It's uh it's a beautiful day here in Boston. We got some sun. Um, cannot complain. So we're excited. To, uh, we're excited about today's guest, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, today's a big day. Not only um, uh, for a lot of reasons. Not only do we get get to talk to our next guest, but I, I guess I'm a little bit uh, on edge here. My son graduates college today, Jay. So Whoa. yeah, you ain't kidding. So I I have crashed crashed through a threshold of getting old that I don't know if I'm quite ready for. It. But uh, our guest today is Jason Glass, and Jason is an awesome guy I met through TPI a couple of years ago, and been following him in, in his podcast. Um, but he's if you don't know him, he's one of the world's top golf strength and conditioning specialists. He owns and operates uh, Tour Performance Lab in Connecticut Golf Performance in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, specialized in training rotary athletes, biomechanics, physical assessments, and functional strength training he's a consultant to top pros from the pga lpga nation uh, nationwide tour european tour as well as pro, uh, pro snowboarding and he's also the head strength and conditioning coach for the canadian national team uh he's a lead presenter as i said for tpi and he's on their advisory board for for their fitness stuff and he's been on the golf channel golf canada magazine cbc sports he also has his own TP, uh, tpi tv show the jason glass performance lab and his, his podcast is also awesome make sure you check that out uh, he's got a bunch of DVDs he's made, um, and a lot of it's been centered around explosive rotation, which is what we're going to talk about today. So uh, welcome, and thanks for coming on, Jay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm excited to be here and, and chat performance with you guys. All right. Well, well, let's start with why golf? Like, how did you land on golf, and, and how did you come end up become focused on training golfers? You know what? I think it's uh, it's kind of a crazy Securitous route towards the game of golf. I'm not a golfer, never been a golfer uh, leading into my career in golf. Um, but that's why I've had success in golf because I came to golf with like a different perspective, a different way of training uh, the golf athlete. I actually came from extreme sports. I, um, I was a skateboarder, snowboarder, surfer, and that's who I like to work with. And that's who I trained. I, after graduating from the University of British Columbia with human kinetics degree, I wanted to train athletes. And I just naturally moved towards uh, snowboarders, skateboarders, basically the X Games uh, athletes. And uh, crazy thing was that some of the athletes that I was working with in the off season, when they weren't, you know, jumping off 50 foot cliffs in the back country of Whistler, uh, they were, uh, they were playing golf. And what we found was some of the exercises that we used to help them jump off cliffs higher, and more importantly, land softly uh, under control, actually helped them hit the ball farther. So what I started doing was, you can imagine that the uh, extreme sports world uh, doesn't have a lot of, uh, let's say high paying clients. Uh, they'd, rather, they'd rather buy a beer bong than, uh, than a training session. Um, so when I started working with some, some like tennis players, golfers, people that are used to paying big money for, uh, for coaching and, uh, the, you know, the, these are people that take a golf lesson every week or a tennis lesson every week. Uh, I started training some of those people and guess what? Using the techniques that we used in extreme sports, they started hitting the ball better. So as it started to grow and I started developing these techniques for rotational power, 
it really kind of grew from a local scene to a provincial scene and started to work with the national team, uh, uh, Team Canada, uh, PGA Tour players started developing through that program. And, uh, and next thing you know, I'm, I'm standing on the driving range at PGA Tour events and I'm not a good golfer. So I don't know how we got here. I'll, I guess I get just kind of explained it, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how I got into into golf. I love the game. Don't get me wrong. I love it. Absolutely. But uh, I'm just not very good at it. So, you know, when it comes to working with golfers, uh, there's always been this sort of debate on whether or not they're truly athletes, right? And, um, and and you still see it now, even with the the amount of uh, you know progress we've made in the sport with TPI and everything else. But how much athleticism do golfers really need, and how much of a difference can we truly make with performance training? Well, I'll tell you what. If if you think about golf and you think of your maybe when you were growing up, your dad or your mom used to go play on the weekend, like a weekend warrior type idea. They had their uh, Saturdays uh, foursome. <sighs> it's it's not that uh athletic i mean it, it can be but for a lot of golfers it's basically they just get out there they put the tee in the ground they put a ball on it and hope for the best but to be world class to be able to play at the level that the pga tour players are doing now uh it's insane i've actually i've worked in the nfl the nhl the major league baseball i've never had a sport that was so precise where one degree of the club face being open or closed could be the difference between making the cut or winning the tournament. It's insane and just uh, the, the degree of difficulty and the club head speeds that they're swinging at. Um, you have to be a highly uh, functioning, coordinated, uh, explosive athlete to be able to execute that at the highest level. So these, these athletes, I'm taking a lot of now, this, this is where it comes full circle. Remember I said I went from extreme sports to golf. Now I'm taking the science of golf and applying it to like quarterbacks in the NFL or uh, major league baseball. And they're going, Whoa, what is this crazy training you're doing? And it's like, well, that's what the golfers are doing. And they're like, Oh, that's what we do in the off season. It's like, well, no, you should do what they're doing in their off season for you. Um, so they're for sure. They're huge, huge uh, performance uh, investment into the game of golf. And, uh, and we're reaping the rewards of, uh, of that investment. So I want to continue on that point because you've 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 kind of gone back to it twice. Is how training rotational power transcends just golf, um, and it carries over obviously to to things like baseball and tennis that that are rotationally based. But even every time I'm on a field or a court and I cut and change direction, that that's rotational power as well. So kind of talk about how that transfers to other field and court sports. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in general, so when people think like, oh, golf, they're going to think that the exercises that I use are going to look like the game of golf. In fact, they don't look like the game of golf at all. So we'll actually use change direction, uh, deceleration, acceleration drills, where if you look at footwork drills, let's say we're sprinting, doing line drills or something like that, and you can make somebody more efficient at decelerating into a cone to touch the cone and then accelerate out of it. Those same muscles that you're using to decelerate and accelerate, are the same muscles you use to load into your backswing, drive through impact, and then decelerate into the lead leg. So the only difference is, is that your feet are still attached to the ground. But the same muscles that you use for, for that movement in golf and the twisting and torquing that you use in the ground, the ground reaction forces, you have to also use to be agile and be able to uh, deke somebody out, let's say in basketball, to be able to step in and break somebody's ankles. Uh, or a running back, be able to deke out a linebacker. All those things that we do, the way we import force in the ground is no different. So when we think about rotational power, people usually think about just chucking a medicine ball against the wall or doing something that looks like a golf swing. Uh, if, if only it were that easy, right? Um, take us through the layers in the process of how you look at rotational power before we even get to the, the last piece, which is throwing stuff fast, right? Like how do you build those sequences and layers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, to keep it simple, and, and I think this is really important for all coaches, take the complex and then boil it down to its simplicity uh, so that it's easily digestible by the client. So for me, I like to think of rotation as three planes of motion. We have our sagittal plane, which is vertical thrust. So if we were to do like, 
let's say, uh, squat to presses or any kind of uh, deadlift, squats, any of these vertical thrust exercises, um, those are going to be the component of the golf swing or rotational power that we put force in the ground in a vertical uh, manner. But then when we add from that vertical manner, we also have to add the lateral component where we're loading into one side and pushing off the ground towards the target. We use those with all sports that transition or transfer weight. Um, now we have to be in the frontal plane. So now we're going to coach exercises that include using the ground in the frontal plane could be like a lateral bound. We're working on things like glute medius adductor exercises where we're pushing against the ground or we're accelerating and decelerating into the ground. Um, so anything that involves lateral pal off presses, for instance, an, an anti rotation exercise, you have to control the frontal plane as well. So we do a lot of exercises in the frontal plane. And then the last plane of action is going to be our transverse plane. And so that's going to give us rotary torques. When we talk about rotation. Now we're pushing and pulling with the ground with our feet in this manner. And what that's doing is up the chain It's starting the spiral effect up the chain. In reality, all three of those things are being done at once. But as a coach, my job is to break down those three components, see which one that athlete likes to use. So young juniors or, or uh, people without a lot of upper body mass will usually use vertical thrust as their source of power. So they use their legs because it's the strongest part of their body. So if that's their source of power, a lot of times they neglect the other two sources of power. So I'll train those and make them feel very familiar, or very comfortable in the frontal plane and torque plane or the transverse plane. And then all of a sudden they start to add those to the ingredients that they already possess. And now we have a rotary athlete. So I always think of it in those three planes. I'm trying to find where's the missing piece, add the missing piece in to what they're already doing well. And then uh, voila, we have rotation. Oh man, do I have a lot of questions, Jay? All right, so let's let's start with. Uh, I love the fact that you brought up the the kind of three planes of movement. And so, are you kind of basically saying that you don't need to do rotational drills all the time to get better at rotational power, right? Yeah, absolutely. In, in fact, we actually I spent a lot of time on anti rotation, uh, resisting rotation. If you think about the rotational muscles that you use, like the traditional rotational muscles that you're going to use, uh, people are going to think obliques and Let's be honest, there's rotational slings that run all the way from your big toe all the way up to your index finger. And you have to train that entire chain of muscles together to work in unison. But to do that, to do that properly, we really need to make sure that, uh, that the body is, is, is functioning in all of joints. So that's where the, the TPI screen comes into play, where we're screening the body and making sure that each segment of the body is anatomically doing what it's supposed to do. And then we have to be able to amplify those things. Um, so the beautiful thing is it doesn't have to look like golf to, uh, to, to be able to use the rotational power uh, in all those three planes, but your body does have to have the function to be able to move in all those three planes. So on that, I know uh, Greg Rose has mentioned, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but talking about correlations between someone's deep squat and their drive, correct? Um, yeah. Wasn't there oh, so some correlations there? There, there is, uh, if you look at the game of golf and you say, well, you know, at what point in the golf swing do you do a deep squat? Um, and that's, that's always been a, a criticism of our TPI screen, the, the overhead deep squat. Um, it's not to determine whether or not you can deep squat because that's what you do in your golf swing. It's, it's if you can't deep squat, it's going to indicate, it's going to give us a little bit of a, a glimpse into some of your weaknesses or your limitations, which could be hip hinge. Now you don't have to hip hinge as deep as you do in a deep squat to hit a golf ball, but it would tell us that there is something going on in the, in the hip hinge. There's something going on with the core stability and be able to stay uh, upright uh, through your torso. It is going to tell us that you don't have ample uh, lat length or the ability to lift your arms up over your head. Again, all those elements, they're a small degree of all of those in the golf swing. But it's going to highlight that we have an issue there that we now can attack through training. So it's more of like it's it's a screen. It's not a, uh, a representation of what the swing is. 
So now that's from the movement side of things. Let's talk about the 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 strength side of things because there's this kind of debate of how much strength is enough, right? And and when am I strong enough to be a golfer? And so talk about correlations of things like uh, whether it's a loaded squat or deadlift and how that transfers over to golf uh, or any, really any rotational sport. And then is there a point when you're strong enough? Yeah. So this is this has been uh, heavily debated. And, you know, I'm on the side of more of the, uh, I think everybody, for the most part, let's just make a generalization. I think most people are strong enough to play golf. I'm just putting it out there. Most people are strong enough if we test their, you know, like squad and we test their bench. I don't know. None of these things would actually correlate in my eyes to how far you can hit a golf ball. But I think most people are strong enough. What they're not good at is the coordination and they're not a good enough athlete to utilize the strength that they already possess. So if in my training, before I start adding weight to exercises, I had complexity to the exercise to make it more athletic. So I might have you in one plane of motion, you master that. You might be able to master a chest press without rotation. Now I'm gonna add rotation or another plane of motion to it. And when I start adding these layers, at some point we're gonna hit a barrier where you can't do it anymore. You're not coordinated enough or you're not a good enough athlete. So I find that when I make someone a better athlete, they express the strength that they already have. Now, I go after that first. So my high triplexity load explode tra training program, it's like an online training program, 18 weeks for the general public. And what I found was coaches were taking that, that program that I designed for the general public and then they're just using it to learn their programming for rotational athletes. And they kept saying, where's the strength training? And it's like, you're doing 18 weeks without really virtually any serious load. And it's like, how does this work? And I'm like, well, that's what we do with our PGA Tour players. So if that makes them more powerful by turning them into rotary athletes, you can always add strength. Strength is the easiest thing to add. It's a recipe, sets and reps. You add sets and reps, you get stronger. Why would you watch a, a, a 18 week training program to find out that you can do squats and bench press and all this stuff? I mean, I, I just feel like people already have that baseline for the most part. And if they don't, that's easy. Just, just put them on a program. All right. So when you talk about the coordination, one of the, I think is Greg in terms of the bullshit meter is looking at someone's kinematic sequence. Like, are they actually using it? in the most efficient way possible to produce power and not have any leaks that could potentially lead to injury. So talk a little bit about the kinematic sequence and how you can leverage things like a 4D or K vest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for, for everybody out there that's not familiar with 3D motion capture, um, basically we take a body and we put markers all over it, or we use a system that has the markers attached to the body, like a K vest or something like that. And the body moves and we record exactly what each segment of the body is doing, what degrees it's moving, how fast it's moving. And from that, we can really determine whether or not you're efficient or not. That's all we're trying to determine, whether or not you are able to push in the ground and have that energy from the ground go up through your, through your feet, through your legs, through the pelvis, up through the core, through your shoulders, out to the arms and express it in a rotary fashion. So when we do that, when we measure it, sometimes we feel like, or we see that the sequence is out of, out of order. So if we wanna go legs, torso, arms, hands, sometimes the arms start the downswing or the arms start a baseball uh, strike or a tennis move. And we haven't actually used our body to hit the ball, we're using our arms to hit the ball. Well, on video, sometimes you can't see that. You can't see what's initiating the movement. So with 3D motion capture, as it says very clearly, this person is starting the move with their upper body, which means they haven't used the force of the ground properly with their lower body. So now we can identify the problem and then retrain the athleticism, the coordination of how to get the lower body to be used better. And guess what? Lo and behold, they hit the ball farther. And hey, by the way, we haven't changed anything to do with the body. We haven't made them stronger. All we do is make them move more efficiently with the muscles that they currently have. I love it. It's so simple and, uh, but it, it's so effective, but people always want to skip the basics because they're boring to some. And, and, and for a lot of people, they, they, they feel like they have earned the right to do the fancy stuff when all they really need is once again, is the basics. But 
Kind of moving on, can you discuss the importance of deceleration, not only in developing power, but in minimizing uh, injury risk? I will, I will, but Mike, I gotta ask you this question. Um, is that sweatshirt your way of asking for some help? <laughs> That's the name of my company. <laughs> SOS, I love it. <laughs> skill, skill of strength. <laughs> I love it. Okay, um, deceleration training. Deceleration training is uh, actually, when, when I told you about the snowboard story, that's how I got into the sport was uh, one of my athletes, Devin Walsh. He's like the Tony Hawk of uh, backcountry snowboarding. He jumped off a 50 foot cliff and when he landed, he hit a rock. He, the snow was covering this rock and so it didn't compress. What did compress was his knees into his face and he lost all of his teeth. He was knocked unconscious for a couple hours and it was really touch and go for a while, it was scary. So when he came back to train with me, when he recovered, I said, we don't have to help you jump higher. What we have to do is we have to help you land and absorb energy better. And so when we started doing this depth jumping and deceleration training, where we're trying to get the body to accelerate and then quickly stop it as fast as we possibly can in the most efficient manner, guess what? His ability to jump got higher. So we're like, wait a sec. When we teach you how to stop, you got faster. So it's like, as we put bigger brakes on the car, the car was trusted. It took the governor off and allowed it, itself to go faster. Now, while I was doing that with jump training, we had people like Tom House doing that in baseball, where he was working on deceleration of the arm, throwing baseballs that were weighted, and he would hold on to the ball instead of releasing the ball. And then he saw pitching velocities going up. So he's doing stuff in like deceleration training and throwing, and I'm doing deceleration jumping in jumping and, and like uh, absorbing energy with the legs. And through the TPI advisory board, uh, we all get together and it's like, we're actually doing very similar techniques, but with different parts of the body. Um, and that really tied in with me that we got to put all these things together and, uh, and work on deceleration training. So basic concept for everybody, that's the story behind where it came from. Basic concept is put bigger brakes on a car. You're probably going to trust yourself to drive faster if you know it can stop. Okay. So now with that, with deceleration, one of the things that's kind of become in vogue and a lot of this is sparked by the works of people like Franz Bosch is working that ability to have some level of perturbation where you have to transition quickly from deceleration to acceleration back and forth using things like tidal tanks and so forth. So talk about, cause you talked about that earlier, that ability to transition from accelerate to decelerate to back to accelerate and that amortization and how much that does that come into play and how can we kind of force feed that by doing some of these strategies? Yeah. I mean, the, now you're, this is cool stuff. Now we're getting some cool stuff. Uh, so this has been a problem that we've had, and I'm going to use I'm going to use the the golf as an example, just because a lot of people that are tuning in here are going to be golf people. But um, in 3D is 3D is great; it tells us how the body's moving. But when we added force plates to the ground and started measuring how the golfer imparts force into the ground, what we found was, and this it's not like we invented this, uh, you know. Uh, in, in the game of golf. This is called physics. Um, every motion, before a motion can be created, force has to be applied. So there's a force that is applied before the body moves. So what we used to think was, we used to think that you'd just raise your arms up over your head with this golf club, and then you would make a transition. And then as the club's coming down, then you'd push with your legs and you would impart force through impact. But in reality, the largest forces are being applied at transition. The largest forces in all aspects are being, as the club's going up, to change direction. That's when all the force goes into the ground. So we always thought that it was at impact where the money happens. So that transition, there's incredible number of amount of force when you're changing directions running. And when you start to decelerate and now you're pushing in the opposite direction, that's where all the weak links start to uh, be revealed. Like, let's say I'm making a cut and my body goes and then my lower body goes and my upper body goes, that's slower than if I jump in and drive out because I have a strong core and I have the lines of force going in the ground and pushing me in the opposite direction. So it's that transition point. And here's the crazy thing. We have now this science to be able to measure grip strength. 
And if you think about a golf swing, you think where would the, the most amount of force go through the grip? Well, a lot of people thought it was at impact. And at, in fact, at impact, there's virtually no grip strength required to hit a golf ball at, at that point. What happens is at the top of the golf swing, when you change direction, woof, they are crushing that grip so hard. And if they don't, they're not going to change direction as fast because their limitation in grip strength doesn't allow them to pull down on that handle and the g's of force the rotational g's of force that are being pulled through that handle have to be managed so from the footwork to the grip so the, all the way from the feet to the hands that torque and the amount of tension put through the body when transition is insane all right so i want to keep geeking out and going and going down the rabbit hole a little bit more so um talk a little bit about how certain things, other things could be leveraged. And one of the things that I think is, I see under leveraged, at least with a lot of the baseball players that I work with is getting them a better understanding of how to leverage breath within that. And so when you're talking about where do I want the peak of my force and trying to get them to match that with the breath, not only the speed of the breath, the loading of their breath, but when they're breathing and that to get them, they understand it. And sometimes I'll have them do a med ball throw and say, okay, just do your throw. And now I want you to inhale, hold that breath, coil. And then as soon as you release it, I want you, I want you to spit the air out as hard as you can. And they'll, the thing will come flying back significantly harder than their last throw. And it was just by leveraging breath. So talk about how you can use breath a little bit in some of these techniques and developing rotational power. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, here's the deal. I like my training to go from the gym to the technical aspect of the sport naturally so i don't want somebody hitting a golf ball and going <gasps> and breathing out as they hit the ball i don't want somebody in baseball while a you know 100 mile an hour pitch is coming at them to be thinking about breath but i do want this in their training every single exercise they do to be able to breathe in create inter abdominal intra abdominal pressure and then release it that valve salve concept i want them to be able to understand that that every time they do a push-up they go <gasps> and they breathe out. So what I do is I use sound effects in my coaching um, and my, my players make fun of it. At first they laugh and then after a while they just get used to it. But if every exercise I do, I'm <gasps> and I make a noise like that, I'm imparting on them subconsciously. This is when I breathe out, I need tension and then I release tension. It's no different than a tennis game. If you're watching, you know, the Wimbledon championship and the, the two women are on an ends and they're just, ah, 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 and they just keep going like that. It's, it's, I mean, it's rhythmical, but they are just ex doing that exact same thing. They were trained to do that. There's no reason for them to go, ah, other than the fact that their coaches told them every time you hit, I want you to make a noise. Now, when you make a noise, you're not thinking about breath, you're just thinking, make the noise. So I don't want them thinking about the function of breath. I just want them to actually breathe. So we do it in the gym. We hope it naturally uh, translates into their golf swing, um, but sometimes it doesn't. Sound effects are great. And, and the sound effects on the podcast are also wonderful. Anybody that opens up their <laughs> podcast with Run DMC is, I'm immediately a fan and I'm subscribing, um, but, I, <laughs> but, but I digress. <laughs> Hey everybody, a quick break in the action here. Hope you're enjoying the show and we appreciate you listening. We're working hard to bring you the highest quality content and best guests every single week. So if you could do us a big favor and go and like and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts on, it would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to listen at the end of the show also to find out where you can find out more information about our courses, as well as a special discount code for all our listeners. Thanks again, and let's get back to the show. <laughs> so, um, so talking about how you kind of put some of these things in buckets and say, okay, well, where do I start? Like you said, okay, well, this person's better in the sagittal plane versus the frontal plane. But I think, you know, the importance of evaluation and testing to kind of figure out the archetype of each athlete that comes in. And I've kind of found that the magical formula for me is kind of the combination of the the fcs from from fms that we're going to do all the different dissected jumps as well as look at your motor control and postural control and then layering that with the tpi power tests of looking at jumps along with some some of the med ball throws that i can i can then walk over to whiteboard and explain to an athlete okay 
here's all, here's how you kind of generate your forces. And then here's where you generate forces from. And this light bulb goes off to say like, well, that's what the hitting coach has been telling me all along. I just didn't know what to do about it. I, I, I know I generate all my power from my upper body, or I know that I don't rotate, don't create enough force and rotation, but now this makes sense. So kind of talk about the evaluation process and how that kind of makes sense of an athlete's archetype. And then again, how you leverage that in your program. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. That, that's a really good question because, um, you know, I, the first time I had exposure to screening was Gray Cook came out with a book called uh, 50 Shades of Gray Cook. And um, it was a great read. Uh, it came out with multiple movies. Um, but you no, know, he came out with a book and it, and it basically, it was just talking about like screening certain things. Like if you can't do this, then you can't do a deep squat. Uh, if you can't do a deep squat, then don't load a squat. If you can't do a hip hinge and toe touch, then de let's not do deadlifts. Like it was very basic, but uh, it really opened my eyes as a strength coach that, oh, there's precursors to movement and they have to be able to do the unloaded version before we can add the loaded version. Now extrapolate that with people like Mike Voigt, who brought up the SFMA, somebody who took what we did in physiotherapy and then took it to the masses of healthy, uh, the healthy population as a performance gainer, man, that just opened up my eyes. So when you had like FMS, uh, FC, FCS, and you go with the FM, like you, there's a lot of Fs, Ms, Ss, and all the combinations you can put together. There's a hundred different uh, certifications. When you put all that information together, this is where it becomes really powerful. You put all those things together and now, you let the athlete's body guide the screening process to where you need to go. So I just did a workshop recently where uh, I had to screen eight people, eight athletes, professional athletes, and the people that were watching in this workshop were just kind of like making notes like, oh, how does Jay train these or assess these athletes? And the funny thing was that all those eight athletes had completely different screens, like not the results. I'm talking about how we got to where we wanted to go. And so we took a different route based on all the information of all those different screening processes. So I'm not going to do a power screen on somebody who functionally can't even stand on one foot and they're struggling to even just just function with their own body. I'm not going to start adding resistance to that because that's so much further down the road. I know that the biggest bang for my buck is going to be getting this person just to move for the first time and move without pain. And then there's someone else who is moving really well, moving really well. We're like, let's jump to performance. Now I'm doing performance and strength uh, uh, variables. And people are like, well, what about, why aren't you doing the, uh, the toe touch with that guy? It's like, well, the body led us down this road. So the bottom line of all this, and you, you put it perfectly, get certified, get educated. The more education you have, I'm not a physiotherapist. I'm not a chiropractor. I'm a strength coach. And as a strength coach, the more I got into the medical screens and understanding how the body's supposed to move or when it's dysfunctional, what the, what the variables are that contribute to it, it may be a better strength coach. So educate yourself. I've been doing this for 25 years and I still, now I'm doing neural courses and trying to learn about the brain and how it interacts, doing breathing courses to learn how to use breath better. Like never stop learning. And that's why I wrote this. I mean, this isn't a plug, but that's why I wrote uh, Dream Big Over Deliver Be Undeniable, a uh, best selling book on Amazon for, for trainers. It's not a big deal. Anyways, where were we? Um, um, I actually did. I, I had a couple other questions I wanted to ask, but you can go ahead, Eric. No, no, no. Go ahead. Jump in because I, I got, I got some so, more as well. So I work with um, rotational athletes as well. I work a lot with fighters, mixed martial artists, um, but I also work a lot with lacrosse. And, um, oh. You know, breaking down rotational power with like a crow's hop or like a, you know, and, and lacrosse, it's very different because you're on the run, right? So there's, and you're, you're shooting and you, you're essentially throwing and from different arm slots, et cetera. Um, obviously the delivery and the way that you look at movement is different. Um, have you guys found uh, sort of any data on, or have you found it possible to look at like the rotational power component, but based off of like a two-step or a shuffle and a throw or like a crow's hop and looking at sequencing there as well, or is it more from a static position? No, that's, that's a great question. And, and uh, you're a man after my own heart because uh, that, that was my sport. I played uh, field lacrosse 
which we call in Canada field lacrosse because we also have box lacrosse, which is in a hockey arena. You know about that, but some of your listeners might not. Um, so I played both box lacrosse and field lacrosse. And I was a midi, which means that I used to love running the entire floor and, uh, and uh, you know, whacking people with a stick. One of my favorite things to do. Um, so that sport, again, it goes back to in the sport, we can't be thinking about rotational slings. We can't be thinking about uh, which foot steps first. And then, then I, now I got to cross my legs over and shoot. There's someone trying to take your head off. So what we have to do in the training room is break down those ingredients that make a great lacrosse player, that make a great, you know, pick your favorite sport, make a great uh, quarterback. They work on the step work of pulling the ball out from the from the center's butt and then crossover step crossover step stagger stagger step and then throw they work on that sequence in slow motion and then they start to add speed to it so it's at game speed so when we transition that kind of coaching and we add it to the game of golf which is a static sport all of our speed training that we use with super speed golf uh, systems we use uh, heavy medium and light golf clubs, but we use those crow hops. We use those uh, step change direction drills. We use what we call the Happy Gilmore drill, which is a crossover step, just like you did in the movie, Happy Gilmore, fantastic. So we use those to get our nervous system to believe that we can accelerate faster than we normally would in a static state. And then when we go back to the static state, which is our feet on the ground, our acceleration has increased. So I always want my training to be harder than the sport, so in lacrosse, what I would do is I would add elements to some of those crossover, you know, crow hop steps that are going to make it more, uh, more kind of dynamic than the sport needs. So when they boil it down, they now have more acceleration. I love that. So I wanna, it, makes, it makes absolute perfect sense. I want to yeah. circle back to the movement part. We talked about being strong enough, but we talk about do you move well enough, right? What is enough? And so unfortunately we look at things in silos and we look at things based on a lot of times unloaded ranges of motion that don't necessarily apply when you get up on your feet and then they got to sync up with other stuff. So I want to bring up to you a question that I got the other night. So I was asked by a friend of mine who's a professor at a college who works with um, doctoral students for physical therapy. And he asked me to come on and talk to them about some strength and conditioning stuff. And one of the guys who's in there is also doing an, uh, an internship with a major league club uh, for baseball. And he said, well, what if I check a, a, an athlete and they, they have enough rotation to be just a regular guy, but n probably not enough for, for baseball. What do I do? And I, I, I kind of want to get your feedback on it. And, and, um, and then I'll kind of tell you what I taught and, and, and see if they kind of jive. So, so tell me what your answer would be when he asked you that. Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, I would say, you know, there's, there's no uh, right, like there's no range of motion that's going to preclude you from uh, playing a sport. Um, you're, you might not be able to maximize your potential in that sport, but we have people like, I mean, John Rom, for instance, in the game of golf, the guy has a backswing that barely gets past his shoulder. He actually has the range of motion to have a bigger backswing. It's not optimal for him, so he chooses not to. But technically, that shows us that we actually don't have to have massive T-spine rotation of 60 degrees to hit a golf ball. Um, but it would be great if you did. It's going to help you if you did. So if you want to improve your range of motion, and that's if you think that that's going to be your contributor to performance, now we have to decide, is this a mobility issue or is it a neurological issue? Because we can do some, some drills where we'll have somebody rotate, let's say, then we'll do like a side bend and then it's called gapping and then rotate further and then side bend, and then rotate further and side bend. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, I just gained 15 degrees of motion. Well, we haven't changed the tissue, the rotary components of, of the body. We haven't changed anything. All we did was trick your brain into thinking that it could rotate further than it naturally does. So that person I put in a bucket and I say, you're a neuro bucket. So now all of my mobility drills are going to involve the brain. And if, I, if they go like this and they go here, I'm only at 30 degrees and I go side bend, rotate more. And they're like, yeah, nowhere. Side bend, rotate more, use your eyes, look where you want to go. And the guy's like, I'm not going anywhere. Then I'm like, okay, now we actually have a physical restriction, a mobility issue. So now we can go into soft tissue if they have the, the 
you know, financial means to have somebody rub and rub and tug their body in a way that makes them feel better, which we all would love, but not everybody has the means to do that. So now we got to go into like some stretching exercises that are going to take a longer period of time. It's going to be a lot, you know, the duration of it's going to be longer, but we could probably get a few more degrees of motion just by doing some kind of mobility work. Okay. So the, the, I want to get your, your input on the three answers that I gave I said, one is the, the more skilled the activity and the closer you are to competition, the less you want to mess with it. Like, I don't want to mm, take yes. this tonight's starting pitcher and then give my whole bunch of range. Like I said, the example of, you know, I've gotten asked a couple of times, you know, I started out, Hey, you want to come and stretch out the golfers before this outing? And I'm like, yeah, if you want everybody's handicap to go up five strokes, because now they're going to go out and swing with a different body that they're not used to that skill with. So how much of that kind of interrelates of when you want to tweak stuff? For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, so ideally, our, our athletes on tour, um, we want to, we have an optimal number of where they're playing their best. So we've been able to record their 3D or uh, just been able to measure them, like actually using, uh, you know, goniometers and stuff. We can measure them, no, you're at your best when you're when your rotation to the right is 47 degrees and your rotation left is 60 degrees now it's unbalanced but that's when you were at your best so we want to set them up every single day at 47 degrees right and 60 degrees left and then when they finish the round of golf we want to recheck them again and reset them now it's not that simple like that's not the like the science of what we're doing but in general if you could take that concept and say, we want you, whatever your body likes to be at, we want to make sure that it's there. So if you wake up and you turn 60 degrees to the right, you're feeling really loosey goosey. Maybe it's a female LPGA athlete um, at a certain time of month where she has a lot of prolaxin going through her body. All of a sudden she's like, oh, my ankles feel wobbly and I don't feel very stable. And I, my rotation of my backswing feels huge. Well, then we go back in the gym, we do anti-rotation work. We do stability work to try and make her feel like she has control over that range of motion, and then she can go play. Where another part of the month, she's super stiff and she's like, I don't know what it is, I can't turn. Then we do the mobility work to get her back to that optimal state again. So yeah, that's where I play, you're absolutely right. I do not want to make somebody have new range of motion uh, because they're not gonna be able to control it. Well, and and I, my second thing I brought up is I, I said, you have to see, is what you're seeing in that isolated test actually showing up when they do their thing, when they're actually swinging, throwing? Because if, if and as Greg, as I said earlier, is saying that, that, that motion capture is the bullshit meter, if they're actually getting it in their swing, but they're not getting it in your isolated test, who cares about your isolated test, right? As long as it's not at the sacrifice of something else, as long as it's not putting them at risk for injury. So are there cases where, and I think you did the example of John Rahm is great, where they're actually executing it well. And so we don't want to go and screw it up just because some isolated test didn't meet a certain mark. Yeah, I, I get that all the time. And, and this is always um, when players aren't playing well, they go, Jay, I don't know what's going on with my backswing. Look, I can only get it to here. What the hell? I used to get parallel. And I'm like, well, send me a live video of your swing. And all of a sudden they go dynamically they get to parallel, but statically, they can only get to here. It's like, well, then it doesn't matter. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's like dynamic ranges of motion. When you take a muscle, now you use the elastic components of the muscle and you put them under stretch, you're gonna get different ranges of motion than when you're statically contracting a muscle and holding a position, a completely different range of motion. Now that, the difference between those two worlds is gonna tell us about the elastic component of the athlete. If all of a sudden they're static and their dynamic is the same, they probably don't have a lot of uh, dynamic elastic stretch in their rotational slings, um, or they're just maxing them out. But uh, that's that's great, dude. I love this conversation. We're getting into the into the weeds here. I love it. Uh, awesome. And, I, and I'm going to give you my last answer that I gave. I said you also have to be careful of not looking at that isolated test in a silo because when we're talking about rotation, there's a lot of things that need to rotate from the ground to the top of your head, and the big three being your thorax, your pelvis, and your, your you know femur inside the hip. And I said, if you look at that in isolation, but don't consider the other two, that you go and add a whole bunch here without considering how it links and relates to the other two, you could create a huge problem. And then to your point earlier, is it a control issue 
and a neurological issue or is this a mobility issue because if you just add a bunch of mobility that they don't know what to do with then you screwed them up as well so talk about the interrelationship of why we can't look at any one isolated test and and, and just locally try to create more range yeah absolutely and i mean that brings up the, the concepts of of compensation uh where somebody with a bad t-spine rotation will end up adding more rotation through their pelvis so it might look like they get their club to the top of the backswing but in actuality, the T-spine is doing very little of that work and a lot of it's coming from the pelvis. Now, here's one of those things and coaches out there that are listening here, humble yourself. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. I thought I knew everything. And then I was talking with a good friend of mine named Mike Boyle. And Mike Boyle said to me one day, he goes, Jay, your rotational exercises that you're using don't actually have any rotation in them. And I was like, what are you talking about, Mike? This is like 10 years ago. And I was like rotational power guy. And he was like, your rotational exercises don't have rotation in them. I'm like, I think they do. And he was absolutely right. Because when we looked at the video back, when you put load on the body, the body doesn't actually disassociate or separate the upper body from the lower body. It's a very vulnerable position. So like you said, they actually move through the, through the hips. The femurs, the head of the femur in the socket actually pivots the pelvis, but the upper body and the pelvis itself move like a barrel. So what I found was the more load I was putting into the body when I was putting more resistance on, this is why I do more athletic movement versus loaded movement. When we add a lot of load, they stop rotating and they just pivot through their hips. And I was like, oh my God, can you believe, like I was lecturing around the world with perform better and doing all these lectures on rotational power and my exercises that I had up on the video had zero separation in them. And it really was humbling, but it made me better coach. So people out there, like, you gotta be careful what you add load to. When you have a compensation or something has to be locked up to hold a weight, the next segment of the body has to take that load. So uh, we, we really gotta be careful when we're, when we're adding a load to exercises. And uh, your example uh, is, is perfect for that. So, um, you know, speaking of, of not knowing everything, and I thankfully have my wife who reminds me how little I know often, <laughs> um, uh, is the, the elegance of the TPI team and, and really that model of where it can translate really into all sports is having medical skill and performance and then how all those interrelate with each other and then having the, the guardrails to um, know when this is my problem, when it's not my problem. Um, and then, but also having that kind of Venn diagram where there is overlap, where I can understand what you're looking for enough to, to be able to talk the talk with, whether it's a, a hitting coach or whether it's, it's any skill coach, as well as be able to talk to the medical professional to your point earlier to say, okay, I understand what you're saying. And that allows me to stay within my guardrails to best serve this athlete and know when this is in my wheelhouse or when it's somebody else's problem. So talk about how that kind of the, the, the blending of that model and how you see it happen in everyday uh, activities that you do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the team approach is so important. Um, and the most uh, effective teams on the PGA Tour, for instance, uh, have that model where we have a medical practitioner, uh, often the medical practitioner being a physiotherapist or chiropractor, quite often they'll double as the strength coach um, just because maybe the uh, just the cost of traveling around the tour and doing all that kind of stuff. A lot of physios think that that's an easy, like I can always just, I'll just train you. But are you gonna train them as well as like somebody who's dedicated their whole life to just strength coaching? Like, you know what I mean? Like there's a difference there. So for, for my teams, I'm, I don't do soft tissue. I can do soft tissue. I don't do soft tissue because I'm not the best in the world at it. So guess what? I'm gonna just train you then we're going to have a physical therapist or a chiropractor who's going to do soft tissue, ART work or whatever it happens to be. And then we have our technical coach. But here's the cool thing. All three of us each and every day interact and communicate what is going on with that player at that day. That communication is the important part. Because if I know he just came off the physio table and he's walking across the parking lot to the trailer where we're going to do our training and I get him a thing. His energy is super low today. 
He's not moving well. There's a lot of inflammation. I tried to flush it out, but I couldn't. He's really tired. It seems very dehydrated. The tissues didn't feel great. When he walks in that door, I'm ready for him. And I'm like, hey, man, how about we just take it easy today? Just do a little bit of floor work and just, you know, that communication is so important. So then as he's going from the trailer out to the driving range, again, another conversation with the coach. Oh, you're going to have a, a, a tough one today because uh, he's really not moving well and he's tired, but he's got to play. So let's just get him energized and get him playing. Now, that same system, I was brought into a Major League Baseball organization a couple of years ago just to look at what they're doing on all three aspects, the, the technical, the training and the medical, and just kind of give them some insight from a different perspective of what are they doing and what can they do better? And what I saw was, and this is what I've told them, all those three segments, the technical, the strength, and the medical, all great. They're all doing wonderful jobs. What they're not doing is communicating. And I did the same thing in the NHL as well, talking to some of their teams. The communication between each, each uh, uh, department was didn't exist. So it was like, this is a simple thing. It's like, have a meeting. Like literally that, that was my, that was my, uh, my big, you know, synopsis after my evaluation was uh, every once in a while, maybe communicate with each other. And they're like, no, no, but what should we do different in the training room? I'm like, they're doing great. They just need to talk to the medical and the, and the technical coaches and tell them what they're doing. That's it. So that communication is the most important part. Absolutely. So uh seems like uh, you're a pretty, pretty busy guy. So anything, uh, what do you got going on for the rest of the year? Any projects that you're working on? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not plugging it or anything, but uh, so I wrote this book, A Dream Big, Over Deliver, Be Undeniable. And it was, it's basically a roadmap for how to become a world-class coach. Um, so that particular part of it, my coaching has moved more towards how do I help other coaches become better coaches? And I'm going to share this with you. It's not a technical book and it's not a technical. I have a mentorship that I do for coaches where I mentor coaches to help them, whether it's technical, medical or or fitness and just help them become better coaches. And it has nothing to do with the actual techniques of coaching, it has everything to do with who they are as people. Um, so it's more of like the background of why did you want to become a coach? What drove you to be a coach in, in your realm and, and what are the tangibles that you have that separate you from other coaches? And what do you want out of this profession? What kind of currencies uh, of life do you want to be paid in? Are you just doing this for money or do you do it because you want to inspire someone else to their best performance? What are we trying to do here? Um, so I wrote that book uh, and then, you know, we have it on the, on the table at Perform Better and there's all these technical books about like how to add more speed, how to add more like plyometrics, functional training but no one's really talking about being a coach and what it means to be a coach so uh so that's why i wrote this book so i'm touring around uh doing talks on that um and i'm really enjoying meeting more coaches and and kind of helping them with the career of coaching uh, and falling and falling in love with coaching again if they've if they've lost their way so I was going to wrap it up, but that just that just prompted another question in my brain. One of the things that I know that you've kind of done on the, on the side, and I don't know if you're still doing it, is you're doing some stand-up comedy for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a professional stand-up comic. I uh, I travel around. Uh, I get paid to, to tell dick jokes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's great yeah. work if you can get it. It, it is. <laughs> um, yes. So I've, I've been a stand-up comic for uh, about eight years um, and then just recently got to the point where you've worked on your craft enough that you become good enough that uh, people want to pay to to do shows. Now, it has it's you don't get paid a lot, trust me. But uh, just being able to go when I'm traveling on the road, let's say I'm doing a PGA tour event or I'm doing a lecture somewhere, I always want to find the local club and let them know I'm coming into town and get on stage and and uh, and do my set. So I, yeah, I'm still actively uh, pursuing comedy, but just as a hobby, I just love the creativity of it. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep doing it until uh, until people you know start uh, unplugging the microphone. <laughs> so what I'm curious about is how some of that translates into coaching and. Not so much in, hey, I can make my people laugh and put them at ease, but there's there's an art to it 
of being able to read an audience, being able to read people, know when to pick up the tempo, know when to back off and, and to know, kind of let the energy guide you from into your next step or where you're going to go. And a lot of that, I would assume, translates into, into what a coaching session would look like, no? Absolutely. Um, I, I, you're, you hit the nail on the head, so I'm not going to expand on a point that you just made because it's, it's perfect. Absolutely. Uh, reading people, being able to change the energy in a, in a space. So if you're in a coaching session and the energy is long or weird or awkward or frustration comes into play, uh, it doesn't always have to be humor, but you know how to turn a room and, uh, and make, it, make it work. But more importantly, what it taught me, and, and, uh, and I wrote this in the book as well, um, this concept of uh, the economy of words. Um, the less words you say in a joke, the funnier the joke is. So taking out the fluff. And what I did was I applied that same thing to my coaching model, and I took out all the exercises that were really fluff, the things that we used as fillers in a workout. Um, to fill time or transition from one exercise to the other, what I realized was they weren't actually doing us any help. They weren't doing us anything benefit. So I call it set up and punch, which we use in the comedy world. I've applied that to the, to my coaching and made my coaching more efficient and more impactful. So instead of long form storytelling type of workouts, it's more set up, punch, set up, punch, set up, punch, where we're just getting just to what we need and sometimes our workouts might be 25 to 30 minutes where they used to be an hour, but we're impactful for that 25 minutes and we're not adding things to the body that don't need to be there. Yeah. I'm thinking about how, if you ever watched it's how Seinfeld looks at the art of how yes. he puts together a routine and he talks about, I'm going to try a different word as my analogy or, or pop culture reference. And I'm going to try it in different places or I'm going to emphasize different words within the sentence to see what lands best. And that's really how I've learned to say, okay, what cues really click? Like what's going to get this person to understand how to, how to really hold their setup in a deadlift or how to express their, their, their power in a throw. And so it's really the cues, the timing, the words, what words kind of hit and what don't and what resounds and what gets people to, to associate with things. I, I see there's huge correlations there. What's the deal with deadlifts? Why would you do an <laughs> exercise with the word dead in it? I mean, yeah, you hit a, you hit the nail on the head there. That's that's exactly <laughs> exactly what we're talking about here. Sorry, I had to do that. I I can't top Seinfeld talking about deadlifts, so we're gonna wrap it up with that <laughs> one. Um, but this has been awesome, just as I expected it to be. Want to thank you, Jay, for for your time. This has been a lot of fun, and people definitely go out and check his his book out. And if you get to to see him speak, he's a, a great dynamic speaker, and I can only imagine that comedy gets even that much better. But uh, thank you again for your time, and want to thank all of you out there for listening. And this has been the Principles of Performance podcast. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. If you've enjoyed our content, please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to. For more information on the Principles of Program Design courses and workshops, visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.